So you've got the presidents of the two biggest economies in the world right here in big tech's backyard, and everybody has questions about AI. How much do you think AI is going to drive economic growth in the Asia Pacific region and really the world, let's say over the next decade? Uh, it's a big question. Uh, it's a good, good warmer, I think. Uh, look, obviously, uh, rightfully, uh, I think the excitement around AI is, is well founded. I think, I'm glad it's a big topic. Let me start with the Asia Pacific question. One of the things that excites me is if you're in a region, Unlike the past technologies, take the PC revolution, you have to in some ways play catch up. Mobile was the first transition, I think, in Asia. You, know, you almost co-developed it. I look at Android. It wouldn't have happened without all the work we did in Asia, our partners in Asia, be it, be it Samsung or HTC in Taiwan and so on. But I think you started leapfrogging, and you, you don't need to play catch up with legacy. I think AI takes it the next step further. I think it's the first technology. I think you're all in a real position to be right, right there from the start mm -hmm. and have a seat as this technology develops. So I think that has profound implications. Uh, uh, you, know, you all can be as AI native uh, as, as what's happening in the US and so on. So I think in that way, uh, you know, it's, a, it's going to have a big impact. I think the way you do that, though, is by as you know, APEC countries, I would say you have to have a pro-innovation mindset. Mm -hmm. You have to embrace it at the start. Make sure you have the right infrastructure in the country to facilitate AI innovation. You're thinking about the right balanced regulation, both from an innovation and safety standpoint. And then as government, maybe lead the way. What are the projects you can visibly do? How do you use AI to digitize services and serve your citizens better? I think if you lead the way and then invest in skilling, et cetera, I think there's a real chance. So I think it, it couldn't be more exciting. India, your native country, is now the most populous country in the world. Do you see AI as a massive opportunity for India, or could it lead to a massive dislocation given the number of lower level coding, customer services, jobs based there? Uh, I do think it's going to be a massive opportunity uh, you know, across. India has. India has to make progress on many, many fundamental areas, right? Be it healthcare, agriculture, food security, climate change, and so on. So an AI is going to help us make progress. So it is a big opportunity. I think even on the labor market, you know, a few things I would say. Uh, there's a study from MIT economist David Order that if you look at today, a vast majority of jobs that exist today are in new specialties or categories that have come about since 1940. So in some ways, this can be counterintuitive. Over the last 20 years, we've all worried about automation, and, and you know, it hasn't quite played out the way we have predicted it. Having said that, I think your question is important. I think for many jobs, it also has an opportunity to play it out in a much better way. Mm. It make the jobs easier to do. Like, you know, if you can imagine, how do you have radiologists to cover India's uh, breadth of population. AI can actually help expand access. But finally, there are a category of jobs where there will be a shift, and I think that's where the only way to make progress, no one can do it alone. You have to invest in the hard work of skilling and workforce transition. Mm -hmm. That's true for India, that's true for every country in the world, I think. You've met with President Biden on AI in Washington, Prime Minister Sunak on AI in London, how do we get to global consensus on smart AI regulation? It's not going to be easy, but, uh, but I would start from this premise that AI will proliferate. So this is not the inherent nature of software. AI advances will get out to you know, all countries. And so it is naturally the kind of technology, I don't think there is any unilateral safety to be had. We all have a shared incentive to solve for safety. You, know, you could have AI go wrong in one country that will impact every other country. So in some ways, it's like climate change in the planet. We all share a planet. I think that's true for AI. So now that you know that that will be true, I think you have to start building the frameworks globally to make progress. I've seen encouraging progress uh, when the G7 happened in 
Hiroshima. I think it was a good start. You've seen more progress. The UK AI Summit last week, the administration here, the White House has been uh, leading the way as well. And I saw good, encouraging announcements even yesterday for US and China to start having a dialogue on AI. Well, that was my next question. Should Chinese regulators be part of this conversation on AI regulation? I, you know, my, my sense is there is no way you make progress over the long term uh, without you know, China and the US deeply talking to each other on something like AI. So I think that has got to be an integral part of how you make progress. So I think I'm glad to see it. And you know, we have to lay the foundations the good thing is we are still in early days of the te technology. So laying the foundations now will allow us to work through the tough issues and build a common framework over time. Google and other big tech companies have been criticized for pushing self-serving regulation and pulling up the ladder behind them in a way that will stifle AI innovation among startups. How do you respond to that? Quite the opposite. I mean, uh, pretty much on most areas we have worked on, we have deeply supported open innovation. You know, if you look at things like Android or Chrome, you know, these are all big open source projects. Most of the current AI revolution is based on work which we have published as a company and shared with the world. And I think as we move ahead, open source is going to play a critical role in driving AI innovation forward. And I think we have to be careful not to do regulation in a way that you know, either harms open source technologies or smaller companies. So I actually think we care about that. You know, I, having said that, I think we are also being asked to contribute for how would you tackle AI safety, right? And so we have to think through issues like that. I don't see this as being at odds with each other. For example, next year, about two and a half billion people around the world would participate in an election. Right. Right. The biggest election in, in history is going to be happening in India. Yeah, that's right. And, and, you know, and many more countries around the world, including the U.S. Mm -hmm. So maybe almost one in three people in the world may participate in an electoral process next year. So how do you think about you know, generative AI you know, causing misinformation there? You know, these are real problems. So we are thinking through areas like that. But I think that, that is not at the, that shouldn't, hinder innovation because of the you know, opportunity we talked about earlier. So we, you know, we, we think about this framework as being bold and responsible at the same time. And I think it's important to do both. And I think that's true for governments as well. We've already seen, you know, as it pertains to India, 3D generated um, holograms of, of Prime Minister Modi, AI generated voice and voice and songs. Um, how do you think AI, and obviously the U.S. presidential election coming up as well, how do you think AI is going to further test election integrity? I think, you know, over time, it's going to lower the barrier for creating, you know, artificial information, which may or may not mirror what's happening in the real world, right? And that barrier will come down. Mm -hmm. So in this cat and mouse game, how do we amp up our defenses uh, against that? We are in early stages, right? You know, we were one of the first companies to announce a watermarking technology for image generation. It's called SynthID, done by DeepMind, and we are providing API access to it. But all of us need to tackle it. The, these are areas where regulation will have to play a role, right? I think governments will have to, over time, pass regulations about what is okay for you know, some of this synthetic content. And, and so, which is why I think you have to think about it you know, together. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman has said repeatedly he wants to know more about what's happening with AI in China. What do you know and what do you not know about where China is on AI? Look, I, I think they're making, from what I can tell, they're making deep investments in AI. The scale of AI research talent in China is just simply astounding to see. So I think, you know, in some ways this question, China is going to be at the forefront of AI, and, and you know, I think that's a given. Um, and so the question is, how do we work over time, both for you know, other countries to make sure you're making progress in AI, and over time, how do we develop the frameworks where you know, countries can coexist peacefully in a world in which AI will be 
you know, everywhere. You know, President Biden actually just said he doesn't see the U.S. decoupling with China, but the world does seem to be on a path to two separate internets. Do we continue in that direction, and what does that mean? It's tough to say. Uh, you know, things go through in phases. Uh, I think we are definitely in a phase where there are more forces pulling it apart. Um, but, you know, inherently these technologies also facilitate easy exchange of information. So I think there are countervailing forces as well, so I think it's tough to predict. I do think information wants to flow freely by nature. So, you know, my hope is over time, uh, you know, things do couple back again. Could AI or cloud, some of these newer businesses that Google has been building, could that be a path back into China for Google? You know, today we, uh, you know, our presence in China is limited, uh, limited, and we are definitely focused on we, we deeply partner with governments around the world. Uh, in fact, one of the big opportunities we have with cloud and AI is many governments are working and they are thinking about how to incorporate AI to transform their services to their citizens, improve their infrastructure, et cetera. So it's an area where we really focus on, but not necessarily vis-a-vis -vis China. Hmm. Now, the conversation around AI is super polarized. Either we're headed toward human extinction and the robocalypse, or we're all gonna have superpowers. Which one is it? <laughs> you know, it, I am I'm optimistic, right? I think as humanity, we have harnessed every technology to our benefits. We've, you know, and, and more than any other technology, I've seen us be worried about it at its earliest stages. So in some ways, that gives me hope. Um, I do think we have to be very optimistic because it can really, you know, drive progress, you know, at a fundamental level be it scientific discovery, like we are seeing with AlphaFold at Google. So I think there's a lot of optimism to be had. And but I think we have to work hard to harness it. And, but that is true of every other te technological advance we've had before. It was true of the Industrial Revolution. And I think we can learn from those things, act earlier, to work hard at making sure there's a better outcome. So I'm optimistic. You pivoted Google to an AI-first company in 2016, and yet there's still this perception that Google is somehow missing the boat on AI. Are you behind? Are you behind OpenAI? You know, look, I mean, credit to them for, uh, I think, uh, ChatGPT was a great product with a great product market fit. But when I look at, I mean, we've been incorporating AI in our products for a long time. Uh, a lot of the underlying technology is built from Google. We are building our next generation of models with Gemini, and I am extraordinarily excited at the innovation coming ahead. If anything, I look ahead. I think we built the company for this moment. I expect it to be a golden age of innovation ahead, and can't wait to bring out the innovations to more people. So tell us more about Gemini. Give us a glimpse. I mean, this is something that's been touted as a magic ingredient for search. What have you seen and how transformative well, look, is it I, going to be? I think all of us are trying to push the state of the art of where generative AI is. Our goal with Gemini, uh, you know, is, is to put out a state of the art model, right? Uh, that's where we would start with Gemini 1.0 and then add more innovations, you know, truly make the multimodal, bring in features like memory and planning in and so on. But we are focused on getting it out. You know, I view Gemini as a series of models. We are focused on getting Gemini 1.0 out as soon as possible, make sure it's competitive, state of the art, and, and build from there on. Google just invested $2 billion in Anthropic. Microsoft, of course, has billions in OpenAI. I recently sat down with Lena Khan, who's the chair of the US Federal Trade Commission, and she said they're hearing concerns that big tech companies are extending their power by investing not just money, but also sharing their clouds with these AI startups. Is that fair? Um, can innovators succeed and startups succeed without allying themselves with big tech? Well, you know, I mean, it all depends on the details. And, you know, in, in these deals, when we do with these companies, we are also enabling them because of our cloud technology. And we, you know, we don't have a controlling stake in any of these companies. So they are independent companies uh, in which we are a technology provider, right? And I think I actually would make the argument the opposite way. If you just look at the last year, look at all the new names we are talking about. To me, it shows that we are in an incredibly dynamic moment again. 
Uh, you know, and so, and, and yes, we, I think we, we have to play a role in enabling the next generation of companies, which is what cloud does. You know, cloud allows us to take the same technology that Google is built on and actually share it with everyone else. So I think, it, if anything, it's pro-innovation, and so I think there's a lot of good things about it. You've been spending some time in Washington lately. There are a couple big trials underway. The U.S. Justice Department, for one, is trying to prove that Google is a monopoly, a search monopoly. Google does dominate 90% of search, which is 90% of like, how we see and experience the world. It's hard to get information and not use Google. Why should any one company have that much power? You know, I, I genuinely think we don't have that uh, <laughs> position. You know, we are not 90% of users' information needs. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at my kids' generation on their phone. They have access to the entire world's information at their fingertips. They're getting a lot of their information from social media. They get to go to wherever they want. And so, you know, those are, you know, not, people don't always go to a general search engine for information. And, and that plays out in the ads market, too. Uh, I think we've just talked about when I look at how much tech is constantly innovating, and we have to work hard every year. Uh, you know, there's irony in your questions of, aren't you in this position? And aren't you behind? I mean, yeah, I mean, so both can be true at the same time. So it's clearly a dynamic moment, and you know, I'm glad we get a chance to make that case. And so I, I, think, I think the facts will speak for themselves. Uh, some of Google's work with governments around the world has gotten pushback from your own employees. Obviously, we've got the world watching the Israel-Hamas war right now. You've got a contract, Project Nimbus, whereby Google provides cloud and AI services, along with Amazon's AWS, to the Israeli military and government. Can you give us an update on that project? Well, it's I, you know, very much in line with what I said earlier. We work with governments around the world. Uh, you know, we think it's a responsibility. AI is an important technology. How do you use it to modernize your country's infrastructure and your services? Project Nimbus is, this was a RFP from Israel's Ministry of Finance to modernize their digital infrastructure. And that's the project. And we're proud to be doing Project Nimbus like we do with many governments around the world. There was, you know, Russia, Ukraine. Now we've got Israel and Hamas. How do you think about wielding Google's geopolitical power in a time of conflict? Look, I, I mean, I view us as a partner uh, to, you know, like-minded governments which share democratic values around the world. Uh, I think we can be a critical technology partner. I think we want to participate in important issues that affect these countries, be it skilling and educating their workforce, be it bringing access to more knowledge and information, and that's the role, and be it helping them build out their digital infrastructure, including AI, and I think that's the role. Uh, you know, we don't see it in a geopolitical context. We see it in an enabling context. We want to be partners to these companies, and, you know, and there are times information plays an important role in these moments, and we want to get those moments right, uh, and so that's the way I think about it. Mm -hmm. Google and so much, not every government is like-minded, right? Google and so much of U.S. tech relies on Taiwan for chips. If tensions escalate between Taiwan and China, how big a threat is that to the U.S. tech industry? And is enough being done to mitigate that risk? And this goes beyond Google. I think in today's world, a lot of the semiconductor manufacturing technology, you know, uh, comes out of the innovation from Taiwan. And, you know, that's a dependency which exists. And so... Uh, you know, but this is, this is not a unique Google thing, and you know, I th my sense is it'll be that way for a long time to come. Eight years ago, you changed Google's motto. Google changed its motto from don't be evil to do the right thing. What does it mean to do the right thing in an AI-powered world? Hopefully AI will also help us, uh, <laughs> you know, give inputs to it. But look, I think it has to be grounded in the fundamental values of humanity you know, human rights and universal human values we all agree on has got to be the foundation for it. And, and you know, you have to build it up from there. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a lot of debate about it, but, you know, that's the foundational thing I would go back to. And, you know, as long as AI reflects the essence of what's good about, innately good about humanity, I think we'll be, we'll be okay. Everyone likes to ask you what keeps you up at night, and I'm curious right now, this year, what, what do you worry about? You know, both, uh, look, I, 
I'm excited because it's an extraordinary moment of innovation. Uh, you know, when I look at the pace of activity, uh, you know, even at Google, it reminds me of Google's earliest days. Mm. So, so there's a lot of energy I get from that, uh, you know, innovation because you know it plays out and it'll drive benefits in the world. Uh, I do worry about many things, making sure we are meeting the moment and moving fast as a company to making sure to the election question we talked about, getting it right and a responsibility to do so. So it's a, it's a balance of all of that. All right. Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google, thank you for spending your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.